between the coaching staff and the players and the parents, like, they saved my life, and they don't even know it. Have you ever felt? Are you listening? Damn. Uh. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in to We Built an Empire. I'm your host, Kyle Wolf. Uh, today, I'm here with Susie Rhodes. Um, she has an amazing story. I'm so excited to hear it. Susie, I'm so glad you're on the podcast. Um, I don't want to butcher your story. I think that what you've gone through and uh, where, where you've gotten to post your accident is truly amazing. And... Um, I don't want to butcher it any more than I have to. So, you know, I would love for you to give us as much context as you can um, around what happened with you on your accident that you experienced on Black Bear Pass. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me, Kyle. Absolutely. So back in 2020, October 2020, I was off-roading with a guy and um, we... We were just having fun. Um, unfortunately, the, I was in a Jeep rollover accident that day. I rolled, I think, like 300 to 400 vertical feet down the side of the mountain um, before being ejected. My dog was with me, um, and unfortunately, my dog was lost for like three and a half days before someone found him. But, yeah, we, we both made it out. Um, I tell a lot of people that... Um, I joke like I couldn't have died on that mountain or on that pass after I got ejected. And that's kind of the truth is I had seven fractures in my spine. I had a dislocated hip um, and a fractured rib. But other than that, I had no internal damage. I had no head damage. Um, they gave me a concussion test. I didn't have a concussion. So. Holy shit. Are you serious? I'm dead serious. Wow. That's great. You had no head injuries. No head injuries. Um, yeah, so I always joke, like, I wasn't dying that day. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. That's, uh, I, I will never forget, I, uh, you know, when it, when it happened, obviously, you know, being that it's relatively local, uh, from, especially from a, you know, a, a, a mountain type town, um, just some of the videos that went out and oddly enough, I, I hadn't when I first met you at the, at the rec center, that's a little background. We, we know each other from the rec center. I go there and you, you work there. And so, um, but it was, it was my wife, Simone was like, I, I think I recognize Susie. And I'm like, really from where, you know? And so it, it, oddly enough, she Googles you or Facebooks or something. And like, I, all of a sudden I see the video that I had seen years ago and it's, the one where it's going past the camera shot and you're just going, what the fuck? Like, oh my God, is this real? You're literally going, is this real? This is insane. This is crazy. So to hear that, I mean, you didn't get out of that accident unscathed and I'm not trying to say <laughs> that, but it still blows me away that you got out of that situation without any head injuries. Like that's wild, especially like on Black Bear Pass. You know, it's, bo it's boulders and rock. The whole <laughs> entire thing is boulders and rocks. And that's, oh my God, that's just wild. So did you, how long after the accident did it take for, uh, did search and rescue come uh, to so your aid? Or? I had one search and rescue up there. Um, I had an ex-paramedic on scene immediately. And then I think it felt like 30 minutes. It could have been longer, but it felt pretty quick. Like tell your eyes search and rescue team to get me off that mountain was like insane. Did they have to fly for life or was it? Um, yeah, I did. So after uh, they drove a van up to get me off and then I was flight for life uh, to Grand Junction where I would spend the next two and a half weeks um, in the ICU and everyone from like beginning to end just like incredible people like I couldn't have asked for a better team between like my EMS driver um, who took me off the mountain and then uh, the pilot in the helicopter. I definitely told him, I was like, please do not crash. <laughs> <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <Please>. <laughs> and I told the driver yeah. in the EMS van off the mountain, I said, please don't crash. <laughs> 
But, you know, everyone, everyone's great. Everyone, like my nursing staff at St. Mary's was amazing. My surgeon did an incredible job on my back. Um, yeah, I mean, you couldn't have asked for a better team. That's pretty crazy. What did yeah. you, um, how long were you at St. Mary's? Two and a half weeks. Okay. Um, and then I got into Craig Rehabilitation Hospital in Inglewood, Colorado. So right outside of Denver. And then I would spend the next three months there. Um, and Craig is Craig is ranked in the top seven nationally for spinal cord injuries. It's hard to get in. Everyone wants to go there. And I let, I got in and I I learned a lot. Um, I have a, incredible friends um, that I still talk to. Um, they're friends that like when we're going through shit, like we hit each other up because we're like, fuck, Did, this sucks right now. <laughs> these are these are friends that you met that at were Craig. also at, at the hospital that were for an injury of sorts or spinal cord injuries. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I have a handful of friends. We're all in wheelchairs, um, all different phases of life, all different accidents. But that's what's so cool about Craig is that, you know, we all have a different story, but like it's so normal. Like you don't stick out. You're just you're there. Like yeah. being in a wheelchair is normal. Um, and that that's really cool. And so having friends like that is really, really important. Um because like we we can laugh and we can joke and we know when things are hard, but like we get it too. Like we understand. Like um, so incredible people. Um, I still keep in contact with my nursing staff from Craig. Um, I went up there not to I went up there a year ago and saw my primary doctor that was up there, which was really cool. So once you're in Craig, that's family hmm, at that's that point. Nice. Did it um I mean you said that it you know, obviously you're you're around other people that have experienced maybe not the same kind of accident or even horrific nature, but people with spinal cord injuries that are that are going through that same situation at the same time. And it's it's obviously a, a kindred type spirit because there's got to be a million emotions, sadness, positivity, you know, just horrible thoughts at times I can imagine. But you're surrounded by like-minded people that are experiencing those same things. Um, so I, I can imagine that those relationships, the bond that you built with those folks is probably unlike bonds that maybe you share with other people that haven't experienced what you've experienced. But did you, when, when you were leaving Craig, did you, was there any apprehension towards leaving because you were, you were kind of leaving that, I wouldn't call it a comfort zone, but you were leaving that, uh, familial type scenario where you're surrounded with people that that know exactly what you're going through and, and are learning how to to cope with it and to... I didn't know it at the time so yeah. when I left Craig I was like sweet like time to go home I'm gonna start living my life I'm done with the hospital room um and that would change a couple months after being home it really sets in like the world is not accessible um, so you have to learn how to do everything different. You have to learn how to deal with people staring at you because you are in a wheelchair. Um, so that kind of like the friendships that I have with those people, uh, they got deeper after we all left really? because, you know, when you're in rehab, it's so easy to just be positive, like awesome. Like I'm alive. I survived. Like I'm going to do all this stuff. But then you get into the real world and you're like, this sucks. Like, and so that's kind of why we all started talking to each other. Like, yeah, it sucks. It's not always fun being in a wheelchair, but like we have each other and we can lean on each other. Like the good, the bad, the ugly, like we have that. But I think those relationships really got stronger after we all left. Um and it's just because, like, you, like I said, like, in rehab, you can be positive. You're in a pretty normal state. Um, and then you go home and you're like, okay, things are things are a lot harder than I thought. Um, and I think we all kind of felt like that on a mutual level. So, like, we all have, like, a group chat that we use. Um, I have some friends that I just talk to, like, one-on-one. -on -one. 
Um, but like it really, those relationships got stronger after we all left. Do they sure. have a, a co- like a, not a coping mechanism, but do they have a, uh, you, you kind of like a, a process for, for teaching you or making you aware of what it's going to be like after, or, or, I mean, obviously I know you're in there, you're, you're trying to, to rehabilitate to a level to where you can go home. So they, I can imagine that the focus is on that, you know, it's all hoorah and happy and, but I mean, do they, are they honest with you at that state of like, look, your, your life is forever changed, you know? And yeah, they are, they're very honest, um, which is great, but like even the honesty can't like really prepare you for like what to expect. Sure. Um, and so they're honest with you. They tell you like, Hey, you have to learn all this because it's not accessible when you leave. Like you're going to have to learn how to do things on your own, in your own way. And so they're honest, but like even honesty can't expect you for like what it is like living in a wheelchair, if that makes sense. Yeah. no. I- or like not, I'm not even going to say living in a wheelchair. Living with any form of disability, like you can be as honest as you want with someone, but it's going to change. Until you go through it, you, you, you don't know what it's person like. Yeah. And even like person to person, like my struggles and what I go through are still different than like some of my friends' struggles. Like we can all talk about our struggles because we understand on some level, but we definitely all have like our different struggles. Sure. Yeah, I can imagine. Does yeah. it, uh, do you keep in touch with, with them mainly whenever you're, I mean, do you, do you talk to them like in the good times and the bad or is it? Yeah. You know? Um, cause I know, I mean, we, I, know, I know it can be hard to like, you've got, I've got friends like that sometimes where it's like, and if it, I feel terrible because I realize this about every six months, but I, I, I call them when I, when I need to talk to them and that, that sounds horrible people probably hearing this, you know, they're dear friends, but it's like, I know that they're a rock for me at times, you know? And so, yeah. but I, I often think about like, man, does, does he feel like we're not friends? Because I, I would love to hang out with him, but it's like, I know he's that like one of those few people like I call when like shit's bad. Cause yeah. I know that he won't be just a freaking echo chamber. You know, he'll, he'll tell me something that I really need to hear, but I realized, you know, uh, kind of a few weeks ago after a conversation, I was like, I need to call you just to be like, hey, man, how is your life? You know, I don't want to be constantly needing you in that fashion. So, I mean, do you talk to these folks? We talk. We, I would say, we like, we talk the good, the bad, and, like, the ugly. Um, I know with, like, some of my friends, we definitely, like, ask for advice a lot. Um, Sometimes we'll, like, bitch about something because, like, we get it. Um, sometimes we just like ask questions like, where do you get your wheelchair parts? Or like, Hey, are you guys having the same issue as I am gain it? Um, I know other friends like I'll talk to and like, we'll joke around and, um, so it just kind of, it's, I guess it's just like the friendship. Like we kind of talk about everything. I would say that my group chat that I'm in um we go like a couple weeks and we can like not talk to each other um I do have one friend out in California that I talk to probably every day (laughs) like we just I don't know we just talk we kind of get along um and he's a great friend to have so do you feel like when you when you came back home I mean I'm sure there's a ton of struggles but do the relationships that you had with with friends prior did that and I can't, I can't say this would be like all inclusive to every friend you had prior to the accident, but did it strengthen or did it weaken with people that don't understand what you've gone through? Um, I had, I had a couple people, um, one pretty recently. Um, I had a couple people leave my life. Like, you know, I'm going to say this as nicely as possible, but they aren't strong enough to be in this life with me and that's fine. Um, and so it was hard when they left. Um, but I have an incredible sports system and like the friends I still have in my life are incredible. Like I could call them right after this and they would ask me 20,000 questions. I could call them 
when I'm at my worst and they would come over to my house and just sit with me, you know? So going through a traumatic accident, like you're going to have people that leave and you're going to have people that stay. And honestly, the people that leave, you might as well just hold the door open for them because you don't want them in your life anyways. Sure. Um, and that sounds really, really harsh, but the friends that stick around, the ones that stay by your side through everything, they're keepers sure. and they have your back regardless. So, um, I think they call those ride or dies. Oh yeah. <laughs> I have those. <laughs> That's good. So I, I mean, it full, full honesty. I mean, obviously you're, you're talking about this and it's very, you, you seem very strong in your opinions, but I, I just have to imagine, and maybe I'm just a weak person at times, and I am. I probably talk about <laughs> depression on this fucking podcast more than anybody ever wants to hear me, but I can't imagine that if we were having this conversation three months after you got home, that I feel like you've, you've gone through it and you've, you're talking like you've built the strength. You've built your own internal strength support system that can hold that door open and be like, bye, good riddance, or, you know, keep the ones that are close to you closer. Um, so how did it come about to where you've kind of grown into this, this strength that you're, you're showcasing? Um, or am I wrong? No, it's, uh, I mean, if you've always just was, been a badass, no, you know, be I've not always been a badass. I promise. Um, on it, like, a few months after I got home, I lost a really, really important friend of mine. Uh, we'd been friends for a really long time. She she wasn't the right person to be in my life. Um, and so we stopped talking. And, like, it hurt at the time. Um, but after the accident, I definitely, like, my spine got stronger. Um and I always make the joke, like, not because I have rods in it either. It just got stronger. <laughs> um, but I also, for 2021 and part of 2022, I battled really bad depression. Um, and I don't know how many people know that or, like, if they just keep it to themselves. But, like, I hated my life. Um, and I didn't want to talk to anyone about it. Because I didn't want to burden them, like, with what was going on. Um, I opened up to uh, my ex-boyfriend about it. Um, and that didn't go over well either. So I kind of just hid my depression. Like, I just kind of toughed it out. Um, and I think in that time, like, in that year and a half, like, I really grew. I went and got counseling, which helped. But... Going through the accident, then living, like, a year and a half of just, like, hating my life. Like, that gave me the strength. Like, and I can't even just say that. Like, I'm I'm rooted in my faith. So, like, when I couldn't rely on, like, people or I didn't want to bother those people, I was constantly talking to God. Like, God, you got me. Like, you got me off that mountain. You're going to get me through this, you know? So... No, it's not. I've had to grow into strength. And like letting people out of my life, like, yeah, it hurts. Um, but you also have to recognize like your self-worth. Sure. And you have to recognize that like you have come really far, like regardless of who you are, like you've gone through a lot of shit in your life. You need to be proud of how far you've come. And if people can't appreciate that or respect that, who cares if they're in your life? You know, because the ones that do, they're going to stay and they're going to like cheer you on regardless. But no, I haven't always been strong. It's it developed. Um, my parents and my family have really been important to me. They helped with that strength. Um, but it like it comes. I mean. But no, <laughs> you have to like, <laughs> sometimes you just have to grind your teeth and say like, fuck it. I'm just going to live life and be did, strong. <laughs> did you ever, but prior to the accident, did you ever kind of feel any bats of 
depression or do you think that the accident kind of exacerbated what was there or, or is it brought on because of the accident? Um, I battled a little bit with it. Um, my senior year of college, I can't even tell you why. I just, I wasn't content. Like I was just going through the motions. Like I wasn't very happy. Um, and like I was doing everything right. Like I was living a great life, but something still fell off. And so I got through that. Um, and then when the accident hit and I was back home, that's when the depression got really, really bad. Um, cause, cause you had the time to think about it. Yeah. I wasn't busy. I had time. It was hard. I mean, like everything about life had just gotten harder. I was pissed off. Um, I think that's it. Like I was just so pissed off about everything that I'd gone through. Like I lost my mom when I was young. I lost my little brother four years ago. And then I lost my legs and it's just like, fuck, life is really, really hard. And I think that's just, the accident was kind of like that breaking point for me. Sure. Like I was like, I, I'm not strong enough anymore. But that's when you, right when you think you're not strong enough, like you go to God. Yeah. Cause you're like, all right, clearly like, clearly I'm here. I've survived all this. I'm not strong right now. I don't feel strong, but I know that you can be strong for me. And so, yeah, I relied on God a lot. What did you start doing to kind of get yourself back moving forward again? I mean, obviously reaching out to God and kind of having that, but, you know, any God-fearing man, (laughs) we're not supposed to just say man as an all-inclusive being anymore, but any God-fearing man or woman or whatever you recognize as, uh, you can pray and pray and pray, but without action, right? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, clearly you, 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 I, he may have woken you up, right? He may have got you through your darkest of times, but like, I, I, I just like hearing you talk about that. I mean, a year and a half of depression. I mean, I've had my moments, my bats where I'm just, I'm just a zombie, <laughs> you know? And I feel like I'm, I'm letting down my kids. I'm letting down my wife. I'm letting down everybody around me for no reason. And they're probably not even aware that I'm depressed, but I feel like, and I'm a failure and I'm just letting the whole fucking world down. And I, and at that time, it feels like I keep adding more on my shoulders. Like I can do this. I can do this. And sometimes, you know, like a big part of it was this podcast, just opening up sometimes into a microphone and not realizing that you're talking to the world and it can help somebody or (laughs) not even help somebody, but just voicing it, vocalizing it was like kind of that, like it got me thinking like almost the line of like, it's okay. You're not a failure. You're not this, you're not whatever. But this in a weird way was you know, it was kind of like that little stepping stone of like to getting myself to being a better person. So, but I had to take that action. You know, it's like, it seems minuscule, but it's like I had to take that weird risk of being like, okay, I'm so nervous about doing a podcast, even if it's with my best friend and we're drinking beers. I'm I'm just nervous. I don't know why. I'm, I've been around him a thousand times, but I know that I'm recording this and it's going to go out to the world on yeah. some BS YouTube page, right? But yeah. it was like, that was that action path that I took a little bit unbeknownst to me. So it's like what I just, I, I, I think that, you know, there's more to it. I mean, yes, God is there. God was keeping you there, keeping you present, keeping you focused on moving forward. But like what, what action did you take that kind of got you to where you are now? I, um, I started working. So I actually started working at the rec center. Um, and that kind of gave me like the weekly stability of like just keeping my mind busy and doing something. Um, I started working out a little bit after working there, which definitely always helps the mental health. And then the biggest thing honestly was I got hired as the JV volleyball coach for Bayfield. Um, and there's something about being in the gym that like, it's so peaceful. I don't, I don't know what it is. I was a volleyball player for a long time. Um, the head coach at the high school train Fouts is like my second mom. Um, one of my biggest role models and just working with her again, um, being in that environment, that was, that was a big stepping stone for me. 
Um, and so that's what the players, like, that's what they don't understand is, like, they, that program, those players, like. They saved you. They saved my life. Um, and, like, I started, I stopped lying to people. Like, when I went out in public and people were like, like, how are you? And I'm like, I'm okay. Like, life's pretty hard sometimes. Like, I started telling that truth to where in 2021, when I went out in public, I was like, I'm great. Like, life is so dandy. Like, you know, I got tired of lying to people because it wasn't always dandy. And, like, I think that's why it's so easy to voice it now is, like, life is not always like bubbly and dandy like life is really hard and it's sucky but like you still have to make the most of it and so being more honest with myself mixed with like coaching and my family like that really helped me get to this point and it wasn't like it was always rocky, but I think I'm finally in that phase of my life where I'm like, awesome. Like, I'm ready for whatever life throws at me. Like, that's, <laughs> that's really good to hear. I mean, that's amazing. Like, to to go from, you know, what you went through to to kind of even, it sounds silly, but sitting on this podcast, you know, because like in, in the weirdest way, and like, I feel like such a goober saying this, but like, you know, uh, I was so nervous, Susie, to ask you to come on the show. And I have such a big fear of, uh, you know, like imposter syndrome with this show. I don't know why. Like I've played in bands. We've played in front of thousands of people on a stage. But th this type of intimate conversation, I know that oft like oftentimes there's a chance that I might be gaining something more than the guest is, you know, in a weird way, in a weird like um, – you know, kind of therapeutic way. And so, uh, I was just so nervous and I was going to that marathon and I was like, I'd forgot. I was, I had like told myself, I was like, okay, you're going to ask Susie if she wants to come on the show <laughs> and she might say no, but that's okay. Like, you know, that's no big deal. Like she has every right to say that. And I forgot that I was going on the marathon and, but my mind was so convinced. I was like, I hate doing this, but I'm just going to like hit you up through Facebook and be like, Susie, will you please come on the show? And, uh, I, I felt so embarrassed. And then we kind of bumped into each other after the race, like the two days after. And I was, I was so like fried from that race that when I wa <laughs> walked into the rec center, I was probably just talking absolute gibberish. But it was, you know, it's it's such a weird, it's such a weird deal um, for me to kind of sit across the table from people in here. And it's sometimes it's it's easy, but but like I say, it's like it's I I go into it anxious because I feel like I owe it to somebody to do a really good job myself because I think I want I need to I need to get grow from this this conversation. I feel like I need to give back to the guests in a proper manner to where they can tell their story because I really believe that I mean, you know, somebody could hear your story and be like, "Oh my god, that's just like crazy wild thing." And then they may look at themselves like, "I don't I don't have anything." You know, but I I really truly believe that everybody has some kind of story and something to add to the world. Right. And yeah. so it's like when you talk about things like being brutally honest, I've been talking myself in my head most of the times about being honest. But one of those times was like, I, I literally, there's like twice where I was like, you know, and I only see you on the weekends if I'm in there. And so I was like, ask Susie, ask Susie, ask Susie, go out to my truck. <laughs> and like, fuck, I'm so embarrassed. Like, why, what, do you, you know? And it's like, I think maybe it is because of the level of your story and I know how important it is. And like, to you and to also possibly some of the public that can hear this, that it was just like, I was like building it up. And it's not that I'm not, I'm not trying to be like, Oh, Susie's just Susie. She didn't have any real fucking problems, you know, <laughs> but like, but it just, I had built it up so huge in my head. Um, that it's just like when I, when you finally said, yeah, I'll come on, it was like poof, this like huge relief. And, um, uh, but it's, it's weird. Like in, in a slight subtle way, I, I do think that being honest, not only to people, if they ask you, like, I know we all struggle because we all want to say white lies. We all want to smile and be like, my life is good, you know, and you, yeah. maybe behind closed doors, it's not the best. But I think even more being sometimes just brutally honest with yourself, even if you're embarrassed or even if you walk yeah. past Susie at the rec center and you want to ask her <laughs> to come onto your podcast, just get the fucking courage to do it because there's, there's, you'll never know 
what the positive could come out of a situation unless you just ask or unless you be present or be honest. And so I love, I love hearing that like a big catalyst in your growth to get out of that depressive state was like being just honest with people because I, I can imagine that that was hard at first. I can, I would, I would love for you to be like, and you probably remember it, <laughs> but like, you know, like the first time, do you remember the first person that you were just brutal, honest, like not just out there, not just in the world being an asshole or a dick. I think I was but, just in Walmart. Yeah. <laughs> like, someone like, yeah. Was like Susie and I was like, I don't have it. I don't have it today. To yeah. <laughs> just smile anymore. Um, yeah, I just, you just, I smiled for way too long. Yeah. Um, because like I did, like I felt like I had to, that same thing. I felt like I had to put on a face, like here I was, accident made national attention. It's on YouTube. Like everyone, everyone's just like, oh, you're such an inspiration. It's like, great. Well, I really don't feel like being an inspiration today. Yeah. So if I can just leave, that'd be great. Um, yeah. And so I think to start, I had to be honest with myself. Like I finally had to recognize like you're tired of lying and you don't have to lie. Yeah. And like everyone should know that. Like you do not, when someone asks if you're okay, you do not have to be like, oh yeah, I'm fine. Like you can be like, no, I'm in a real shitty mood today. Like, are you going to hurt their feelings? Who cares? Yeah. Like that's how you feel. Um, like don't go and be an asshole to everyone, but like if you're having a rough day, like, okay, like yeah. we all have rough days. Like we all understand. And honestly, most of the time when people ask is to make small talk. Yeah. And yeah. like, no, absolutely. Yeah. I yeah. Think, and I, I try to refrain from that. Like in most cases, like I hate small talk. I, I would rather in a weird way, I'd rather people just get to the point of like what it is. Yeah. Like, I mean, I can bullshit with the best of them and like, <laughs> yeah, we, I mean, that's part of the real estate job. Like you got to bullshit and you got to like service the industry. But like, sometimes I just, I, I think that there, there's a, there would be a level of like clarity if people would just like, just get to the fucking point. Like, I, you know, like, yeah. do you want to just ask me why I'm in a wheelchair? Yes. You know, like, here's the fucking answer. Yeah. Now, what is your real question? Like, what do we want to get, you know, it's a, but I think that should happen in a lot more cases and, you know. Um, and honestly, like, I like when people are like, working at the rec center in particular, um, like more people, like they're open. They're like, hey, like what actually happened? Mm -hmm. And it's kind of the same thing. Like once you tell them, they're like, oh shit, I saw that video. Yeah. Um, But I think, that takes a lot. Like, that's a lot of courage. Like, because you don't want to sound like an asshole for like, hey, why are you in a wheelchair? But like, also, thanks for asking. Like, yeah, it's a part of who I am. Um, And I think I'm just speaking like from me, but like when people don't recognize that I'm in a wheelchair or like when they try and like skate over it, mm -hmm. I get really offended by it. Because I'm like, dude, like, yeah, I'm in a wheelchair. It's a part of who I am. Um, and so do you feel like people should, do you, do you feel better when people like overly recognize it? And I ask, and I ask you this because like, I've never, I, you know, we've talked tons of times at the rec center, but I've never once asked you like, well, because I knew, I, yeah. part, you know, part of me knew the story. Um, and so there was kind of that, but I've also never like overtly been like, why are you in a wheelchair? You know, yeah, why are you in a wheelchair? Or like, oh, hey, Susie, don't move. Let me come around the counter because you're you're disabled. Like, you know, like that's kind of like, putting myself into that that mindset of like, so do you, how does that make you feel? I I don't mind people asking me why I'm in a wheelchair um, because like it's just like a part of who I am. Um, but like I think there's that fine line of like, you can wonder why someone's in a wheelchair and hear their story. Um, but also don't just assume like that because we're in a wheelchair, like we can't do certain things. Sure. Which I know is like a big conversation in the disabled world. Like a lot of times able by people, like they don't know that like we live very independent lives. Like, yeah. Um, and so I'm always okay. If someone asks like, Hey, like how do you get around? That's a fine. I drive. Sure. You know? Um, so when people ask about my disability or how I do something, great. Like, 
I full heartedly like respect that. Like, go ahead and ask how people with disabilities do things because that's the only way everyone's going to know. Yeah. Versus like, if you don't ask and you are just like, eh, it's just like a person or like, you know, like, sure, sure you know, you're not learning our side of the thing. Like you're not learning the disabled side. You're just kind of ignoring it. Sure. Sure. Um, so like, I'm totally okay when people ask me questions, I love it. Like I'm very open about it. And I think the only way to build like, to build like a good society where everyone kind of like gets along is to be open about like, awkward conversations sure. like <laughs> yeah, i don't know like yeah. don't be like don't feel like you're offending someone by asking a question mm. just ask it and then if it is offensive like you're gonna know someone's yeah. gonna be like that's offensive yeah, yeah i mean and there's you know this is it's kind of a similarity and i talked about this to a, a guest friend of mine from chicago but you know like the whole uh, almost like color blindness thing right he and I are super good friends, like really, really close. Um, he's been out here many a times, stayed with us. We we don't we don't overly engage in a way to where it's like we're we're just friends at that point. Like I clearly know he's a black guy, you know, yeah. he's a six four gigantic <laughs> black man. Like I I understand it. Um, but you know, he's had he's had that conversation with me before. Like there's there's a lot of people that take a, a little bit of offense if somebody is just overtly trying to get around the way of recognizing or just being you know acknowledging the fact that that person is of different color or that person is black or what you know what i mean it's like when you just completely ignore it and it's like you know i rec- like the the classic conversation is like i recognize you as a person you know like i don't see you you know, I don't, I don't see you as being handicapped, Susie. It's like, yeah. well, well, hold on. No, that's, that's not, you know, but his whole comment is like, there's, there's kind of two different frames. There's like people that get very upset at the fact that like, they're not acknowledged as being of a different race Then, it, 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 depending on whatever that group of, you know, of people is at that moment. But then there's the other side of it where people, they kind of just like allow it to happen, which it just like almost like muddies the water, right? We're all just beige. It doesn't matter. Yeah. It's like, well, we're not though. We're, you know, we we do have to acknowledge the the fact that we are different, and through those differences, we're we're okay. But it's good to to be different, and it's good to be, you know, it's okay to recognize the fact that my friend is of a different race and has completely different world problems. It's okay to recognize the fact that you are in a wheelchair and that you have a whole different world that you have to contend with that I don't. But if I were to just sit here and have a conversation with you and never acknowledge the fact that you were in a wheelchair or we were just, we're the same, Susie, we are. You know, yes, we are human beings. Yes, we are loving, kind, caring. Yeah. But we have different lives and it's, it's you know, I, I'm a firm believer that it's, it is okay to like acknowledge, acknowledge that, it. you know? And like if we just blindly, if I only ever look at you in the eyes and I just walk <laughs> past the desk, hi, bye, Susie, have a good life, you know? Like I just, I think that that doesn't do it a disservice. But then there's the polar opposite of like when you have people that are overly, uh, you know, overly stating the fact of like, you know, going back to it again, like, you know, I'm acknowledging the fact that you're black and I'm proud that you're black. I mean, you know, I'm acknowledging yeah. the fact that you, and you are such a powerful person. I'm, you know, it's like, it's, it's polar opposites. You almost have to find like that happy medium. Yeah, like, yeah. awesome. Like we, I always have this conversation, like I'm getting my master's in counseling and like, this is a very common conversation, like that I've had to have and I've had to learn. And it's like, yeah, you have to meet people in the middle. You have to recognize that, like, yeah, we are all people, but we all have different backgrounds. We all come from a different place. Like, and for everyone to just treat everyone like they're the same, that's not building a good society, like, at all. Like, we should recognize everyone's differences, Mm -hmm. accept everyone's differences, and be okay that we're all different. Yeah. And I think that's, like, that's meeting everyone in the middle. Yeah, like there has to be that... It has to be the the good middle ground, right? The the 
the creamy white fluffy stuff in the, <laughs> in the ding dongs. So yeah, you know, but I, yeah, it's it's that's a hard conversation with people because just like anything, like polar opposites, it's just you know, it's just you have people that just flock to it, and that's just what they believe, and that's their ideologies, and you know, and then that kind of carries over into the way that they interact in the world, like the the way that they view race, the way that they view. Uh, you know, colors, the way that they view religion, the way that they view uh, disabled uh, people. And so it's yeah. like, it's like, well, I mean, we can, we can all we, coexist. We can all coexist <laughs> and we're just here in this middle, you know, this middle ground. So you, you said something a little bit ago and I, you know, if you don't want to talk about them hundred percent, but um, you know, you, you said that you, you lost your mom years ago. Can you, can you talk about that a little bit or is that? Yeah. Some, okay. Um. So when I was seven, like it's been a long time, um, but when I was seven, my mom passed away f- uh, from breast cancer. Um, she fought like three years, stage four breast cancer. And so um, I live in a blended family. I love my family. I have an amazing stepmom. Um, I have an amazing family. And so I think when people meet me, like they are like, oh, you're so inspirational because of the accident. But, like, I have a whole, like, backstory that a lot of people don't know about. And a part, like, one of my biggest traumas in life was, like, I lost my mom at a very young age. Um, And I remember, like, growing up and, like, it was just kind of hard. Like, all my friends were like, oh, like, I get this from my mom and I get this from my dad. And, like, I remember feeling, like, a little lost. Like, oh, I don't know what traits I get from my mom and my dad. Like, I have red hair from my mom. Like, (laughs) that's where I got it. Um, But, like, that played a huge part in, like, growing up. And I had to, like, really come to terms with that. Um, And as I got older, like, going through life events, like, it's still kind of hard. But, yeah, like, I, I feel like a lot of people don't know that there's a lot more to my story than just like the accident. Like everyone knows me from the accident, Mm. but there's a lot more. And so uh, it's nice. Like it's going to be nice for people to know like that background. Yeah. Um, Just like I, we lost one of my brothers like four years ago. Like some of the community knows about it, but you know, like, that's also, like, a big trauma that happened in my life that when you talk about, like, being strong, like, big traumas, like, make you who you are. Um, And so, like, I'm okay when people call me inspirational, but I want them to think of me as inspirational for everything that I've sure. gone through, not just, like, some some crazy accident that happened. Yeah. Um, But, yeah, like... What happened with your brother? Uh, um, he committed suicide. Um, and it's this is gonna hit home, so I apologize to my parents. But um, he committed suicide back in 2019. Um, and it shook our family. Like it was really hard, and not just our family, but like the community. Like he graduated from Bayfield. Like. You know, it hit a lot of people. Um, And so, like, that was really hard. Um, And honestly, like, when I was going through that, like, year and a half of, like, hating my life, like, I thought of him a lot. Um, And I thought about, like, what my family had already gone through. And that was kind of, like, a driving force. Like, okay, you don't. You don't want to do anything crazy. Like you can't put you, them through that again. Yeah, you like I couldn't put my family through that again. Um and so like he also like he played a big part in like me getting out of that depressive state. Um but suicide's really hard. It's not a fun topic to talk about. Just like depression isn't fun to talk about. But I think it's also really important. So like I I'm really open with everything that I've gone through um, because I, it's important. It's important for everyone to know that, like, an accident didn't just make me strong. You know, like, I didn't just go through an accident in the last three years. Like, 
I went through 26 years of a lot of shit that helped make me strong. That like helped motivate me to do what I want to do, live how I want to live. And so I feel like people sometimes forget about that. Like we all come, like we all have baggage, right? And we don't talk about it. And sometimes it's because it's too hard to talk about. But for me, I I think that's the one thing that I wish people knew early when I got hurt because everyone was just like, oh, you're so inspirational. Like, you survived this. But it's like, no, I survived way more. Like, the fall down the mountain, like, was nothing compared to some of the losses. Yeah. You know? Um. So, yeah, I, like, it's nice to, like, it's going to be really nice for people to know that side, too. Um, And I'm really open about it. Like, I don't know. I don't really have anything to hide about it. Did that make the relationship between you and your, your parents stronger? Or did it kind of have a bit of a divisive nature? I mean, I, I know sometimes I've just, and unfortunately, you know, parents that have lost children and, and things like that, it, in, in the weirdest way, like sometimes the human brain, when you need each other the most, like sometimes there's those like tragedies that sever you from the people that you know the most because you, you're just no longer the same after it happens. You, you're, you're, you're mentally changed or altered. And I know that, you know, in a lot of, especially like child loss, chances are a majority of the, the relationships you know, you end up kind of severing that tie because it's like you, you were that person, that relationship when you had your child. Now that the child's gone, it's like, how are you supposed to be the same person? You know? And it's like, I I can't say that that's everybody. Obviously it's not the case, but, um, did it, did it bring them closer? Um, I think after that happened, our whole family got a lot stronger. Um, and in different ways, like, my stepmom, like, and it was one of my stepbrothers, um, not that it, it matters in any way, um, but, like, my stepmom is incredible, like, she is <laughs> very, very strong for, like, living through that, um, but I would say, like, my family, we just got stronger, like, we came together, we did what we needed to do, um we got stronger and that's exactly what happened after the accident too like the accident happened um and we just got stronger so for at least my family when shit hits the ceiling like we come together we do what we need to do for each other and we just have that that kind of bond like we're just we're a strong crew you know yeah no i there's a, there's a part of me that's, I mean, I, I say this very cautionary. <laughs> I, I'm not envious of what has happened to you, but, um, my wife and I and our children and her family are very, very close, like pretty, pretty close knit. I'm really close with my brother. Um, but recently, um, had some things kind of transpire and to, to such a negative point that in all seriousness i i i am to a point and it's it sad it really saddens me to say this but like i made the the statement and it was because it was led by a very in my opinion a horrific statement from from my parents about something it was a mistake on this show i said something kind of hastily and was trying to give context to what I was about to ask the guests next. And I said something about my father and it came out as if he was a drug out, drug addict and alcoholic, uh, previously and still is. And I, the way I went back and listened to it and he's not a drug or alcoholic anymore. He was, but what I was trying to say is that, you know, in that state of recovery, you're always in recovery. Like that's the whole 12 step model. 
And so, but it was what I said was in his mind, unforgivable. And what he said to me in response to that, <laughs> uh, unfortunately was unforgivable. And so it's, you know, here very recently I've, uh, lost all communication with my mom and dad and it's, uh, it's super rough. It's, you know, bless my wife's heart is, you know, she knows I will, I'm, I'm very much that person that'll put the smile on, but like, it's okay. It's good. We're fine. Yeah. <laughs> fuck them. We're fine. Yeah. But it, it destroyed me. But what kept me strong, and this is why I'm envious of your situation is that because of that scenario, I was able to look at the fact that I would never, ever say that to either one of my children. And those, those kids could, for any reason, and they probably will at some point in their young adult life, hate <laughs> me. I will always, always, always be there for them, no matter what. Even if they don't want to see me, I'll be at the edge of the basketball court, or I'll be on the edge of the soccer field, or I'll be at the, you know. So it's like I couldn't imagine myself saying what my – dad said to me and then I couldn't imagine my mom just willingly following that comment of one of her children and so it, it ate me alive but I was able to get through that because my wife was like look I'm if you know I'm here I'm here for you and you're not you're not yeah. them you're not those people and so I say I'm envious because it seems like you have a strong family you have a strong mother and father and you have a strong you know just it, it's built itself into that and so yeah. maybe that's because I'm a bit more weak minded <laughs> or whatever, but you know, I get a, a breath of that sometimes from my wife's side of the family and her mother. Um, and she's very much the matriarch of everything. And she's just, she's, she's a great human being. Um, but yeah, I, I am envious of that because I don't feel like a lot of people have that family oftentimes that, you know, you, I, I, I mean, everybody's always like, oh, family's everything. Family's everything. And family's, you know, you know, thicker than blood or, you know, blood's thicker than water. Yeah. And that, that is the case for a lot of families, but it's not the case for every family, you know? So to hear no. things like that, like, I don't know that you could have gotten through your mother's loss, your brother's loss, your accident, post-accident. I don't know that you would be able to be here today sitting, talking as strongly if you didn't have the family that you have. So my hat's off to you guys <laughs> in the relationship because not everybody has that support mechanism and so that's a lot that all you guys have experienced and to hear you say that like we're stronger you know we'll never forget any of that that happened but you're stronger today because of all that has happened is fucking amazing yeah and i think i think we have all gone through like we've all had like rough patches here and there with each other um and i think just over the years like we just we are. We just get stronger. And I noticed in rehab, actually, and even when I got home, I was like, my family is my rock. Yeah. Um, Like, my dad in particular, he's my rock. And so uh, um, I think I really noticed that because I had, I had friends in rehab that, like, lost family members. And, like, family just kind of cut them off. And I was like, that... I couldn't imagine. And so like my immediate family is super strong, but not only that, like my cousins, like my whole family, when shit hits the ceiling, like we rally together, we do what we need to do to get through. But like, it just constantly makes us stronger. Um, but like we have our like little tiffs yeah. inside of it, but yeah, you make a great point. That's and a family though. Everybody. <laughs> yeah, right? Everyone has tips. <laughs> yeah, it's but, not always uh, sunshine and rainbows, but. Yeah, I mean, I, on my really hard days, like, I still have to remind myself that I have family. Um, because like you said, like, not every family is like that. And I think that's really important. Like, I always, like, I have the saying, like, I have good days and hard days, but, like, I don't believe in bad days. Because, you know, there's something good in every day. Sure. And even, like on those really hard days that seem bad, they're just hard, yeah. you know? And on my really hard days, like, I do, I go to my family. I I will call my dad. <laughs> my dad will answer, and I'm like, Dad, this fucking sucks. He's like, all right, get over it. Yeah. Like, benching today, he said, oh, that's a little weak. 
115 is <laughs> a little weak for you. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I'm really grateful that I have my family. Sure. Um, because I couldn't imagine, like, this life without them. And I, I wish everyone kind of could experience— not experience everything that we've gone through, but like experience that like tight knit yeah. um, family because it plays a huge role. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I like I married into my wife's family. There's 16 of them. There's a, <laughs> just a fuck ton of them. Uh, they're all sisters. You know, we've all, they've all, we've all have kids, every one of them. And, and uh, yeah, it's like we have Thanksgiving dinner and there's minimum 16 people are coming over if all the kids and then, you know, my brother-in-law's parents, if they're coming, there's like 25 and there's just, <laughs> I married into that family. You know, we've been, we've been together for 16 years and I wouldn't change a bit of it, but you know, I, I, I will, I will probably, you know, I'll just openly say that I, you know, I think that their family is so, so tight knit. It kind of just has this, the good and the bad, right? There's fights, there's yelling, there's all kinds of stuff. And that just happens. Sometimes you just move to Texas because you got to get away for a year or two and you come <laughs> back. But you know, despite all that, they're still really strong. Um, you know, and, and my mother-in-law keeps that held together. She's a, she's a wonderful, wonderful human being. But I will say that I think kind of the beginning of the downfall, right? And we've been together for so long now that it's just like you would think that somebody could get through. But I, I don't feel that my parents could ever penetrate what that close-knit felt like. You know, in a yeah. weird way, it's, it's, uh, I get it. and I do think that it kind of had a, it led towards, you know, this was just building and building and building for years. And then, you know, it's one of those things where it's just, I think it kind of was the straw that broke the camel's back. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, feeling and being a part of that, whether you're married into it or whether you're born into it, that clo close knit family that, you know, you can count on is just, I wish that on everybody, I, you know, yeah. cause not everybody has it. Um, but uh, fortunately I get to ex still experience it and it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing. So, so do you, you know, going through what you went through with your, with your brother and, and suicide, do you do any, or have you done any work with, with like local people on, on that? Because that, that's a, I've taught like in a weird, strange way. I don't know why this damn podcast, every time somebody's on here or I'm talking, we talk about depression or suicide <laughs> or something, uh, but it, it's, it, and it could be depressing from somebody listening to it, but I, there's such a chord, you know, there's a vein that like, every, it, I, I don't call somebody and go, Hey, are you depressed? Would you like to come on my show and talk about your depression? I think you know, it's, it's because depression is like that hidden thing. Like everyone, I guarantee everyone at some point in their life has felt depressed. Sure. Whether they want to admit it, whether they don't want to admit it, like everyone has felt depressed. And we live in a culture and a society where we don't talk about it. We put on a smile, like everything's fine. Everything's great. Um, And like you said, sometimes it's just easier to like sit with someone in front of a speaker and like talk about it because it's a lot harder than talking about it like in person, like you're not gonna go up to someone and be like, I'm super oppressed today, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. But I think everyone at some point has felt depression mm. and there's different levels to depression. Like, um, I'm pretty sure there's like three, but everyone's like felt some form of depression and we just live in a culture where we don't accept it. And it's unfortunate. Because I think if we did have more open conversations, we could probably save a lot more lives. Mm -hmm. um, and the whole reason I went into counseling and decided to get my master's in counseling was because I wanted, I wanted people to know, like, it's okay. It's okay that you feel this way. Yeah. Um, you're entitled to your feelings. And I will help in any way I can. And that's why I went into it. And the more I learn about counseling and, like, how people feel, like, people need to feel what they need to feel. But it's hard to do that when we live in a society that's like, yeah. no, we need to be A, B, and C. Like, we can't talk about these hard things because— We need to be happy all the time. We need to be perfectly in shape. We need to be beautiful, gorgeous. Yep. Your hair has to be cut. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah we live in yeah. this, like— picture perfect world like oh yeah we need to do all this but like 
let's be real, like no one is perfect. Yeah. And yeah. I think for some people who really, really struggle with depression, um, it's just because they don't really have that safe haven to like go talk to. Yeah. Um, I did get into counseling. I was able to do that. And so for a good year, like I worked through a lot of like hard feelings um, and that really helped me. But, you know, some people either don't want to or they don't think they need to or mm -hmm. whatever it may be. But I think just talking about it, sometimes it's just that like release. So like people coming on here and talking about it, sometimes it's just like, I feel so good. Like yeah. it's their release. Like they don't have to hold it in anymore. Um, so well, I think that's, you know, that is the the common vein with everybody that is talking to me about it or you know i've felt it personally where it's just like you you do get to just you know it's like my i was asked the other day by somebody like what well, i'm always like why do you do the podcast or how'd you start it you know and i went on to um you know i i had uh I had an electrical company for years we we overbid a job failed miserably and went belly up bankrupt you know and so like i felt like an app i just felt like a failure for so long and i've told the story to nausea but um you know, we moved to Texas and, and that's when the depression really started in. Cause I was like, you can run from the problems. You can go make more money. You can do whatever and just kind of stack and stack and stack. And it was like, a uh, Ashley McBride song came on the radio one day and I had to pull over. And I was bawling like a fucking baby. I mean, just tears rolling. Like what is wrong with you, man? <laughs> what is, you know? And, um, yeah, it, it, but it, that is what got me questioning myself. Like, why well, have you been depressed? Are you depressed? Have you always been depressed? And then that kind of has a spiraling negative effect in a sense. But the the first time I felt like true, true relief as I went on to uh, Eric Nelson's podcast, it was the first time I'd ever been on a podcast. And we had just come back from Hawaii. We had 40 hours of traveling. I was two Red Bulls deep. And he's like, we can reschedule. I was like, let's fucking do it. <laughs> you know. And uh, he has a very structured show. And it's, it's very regimented on the questions that he asks because it's an investment type show. And so he... Uh, you know, he starts out and he's like, well, give us your two minutes skinny. And I, I like look up and it's 20 minutes in and I'm still talking. He hasn't said a single word. And I just tell my whole story. I mean, and, and then he starts, well, hold on, we got to unpack all that stuff. Like, and then we just go off script. The, the show's lost. There's no, he doesn't ask me a single other question yeah. and we get into it and it's like, wow, that's pretty crazy. And then we end the show and I just, you know, I like kind of sit there and I'm like, oh, okay, whatever. And then I stand up and I'm walking around and I just felt like this weight, like, Yep. Oh my God, I just told, and then I start going to panic mode. Like I just told the whole world, he has a fairly popular podcast, <laughs> the whole world about my problems. Like, what did I just do? You know, but I signed up for it and I agreed and I'm just going to put it out there. And then nothing came of it. And then like three or four months later, we were in Denver at a conference that he was hosting his company. And we're doing like a mix and mingle because it was like a Thursday, Friday, Saturday meeting. So like Wednesday night, we're doing a mix and mingle and we're having drinks with people and introduce myself. I have no idea who any of these fucking people are. And I'm having a gin and tonic uh, with uh, some um, uh, web designers that Eric had introduced me to. And somebody comes up and they're, hey, how you doing? I'm Kyle. And they're like, you look really familiar. And I'm like, oh, uh, yeah, I'm friends with Eric, both from Durango. Are you from there? And he's like, no. Oh, bankrupt guy. And I'm like, oh, fuck. And then it was like <laughs> that same thing happened like five or six times that night. And it was kind of just like, wow, all right, okay. So it sucks that that's how you're know, known. <laughs> know me from bankruptcy. <laughs> but, you know, it's kind of cool that every one of them was like, man, that was a pretty powerful story. Like you should tell that more often or you should, you know, I think a lot of people, yeah. they feel miserable and they feel defeated after bankruptcy or drug addiction or whatever. And uh, then Eric comes up, we, we had all had too many gin and tonics. And so he's talking to his, um, his uh, uh, company that manages all of his media. And he's just like, yeah, Kyle's starting a podcast. And I was like, oh, am I? <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> so then it would just, he just wouldn't let up and he was relentless and relentless. And he's like, you need to do a show, man. And I was like, I think, I think you'd be good at it. And so it was like, you know, what, what do I do? I, yeah, fuck <laughs> it. But what do I do it on? And I had, I had a couple of like investors scheduled and I was like, all right, this will be good. And this will be real estate related. And, you know, and so they both canceled because of, uh, some kind of issues. But, uh, so then I called my buddy who was a touring engineer and he was out on, on tour at that time with Imagine Dragons. 
And so um, I call him. I'm like, hey, can you do the show? He's like, yeah, when, when are we doing it? I was like, tomorrow morning. He's like, okay, yeah, fuck yeah, let's do it, dude. And so I get on. We're doing a remote at that time, it's the first episode. And so it's remote. He doesn't log in. I'm like, what the fuck? So I'm texting him. I finally hit him up on Instagram, and he calls me. What are you doing? I was like, dude, we got that podcast. He's like, oh, fuck, give me, give me five minutes. I'll, I'll log in. <laughs> and so he had, they pulled an all-nighter because they did. Uh, they were in Boston, and they did a huge stadium show. And uh, so he wakes up, and he's like, he's like just haggard looking. You know, it takes a huge rip off of a, a vape pen. And <laughs> he's like, what are we doing? We're filming. I'm like, this is, yeah, it's not live, but it's recording for sure. And that episode was so good because he's wild and crazy and he doesn't care about it. He's like, this is just who I am. Take it or fucking leave it. You wanted me on the show. This, And that set the tone for this podcast, which in, in a weird way, like was like my next steps. Like I was super depressed in Texas. I got on a podcast. I just revealed my whole story. I go to Denver. I keep getting convinced to do it. I've got this model, right? That's like, it's going to be, it's going to be investment only. It's going to be real estate. I get my crazy ass buddy on there and he sets the tone for the whole show going forward. And it was like, oh man, that's, that started the healing process for me. And it was so unbeknownst to me, but it was like taking one step after another and a nudge from a buddy and a conversation of like, Hey, are you okay? Whatever, you know, yeah. and that set everything. And I think out of this will be the 30th episode. So out of those 30 episodes, besides the, maybe the solo ones, and I still get something out of the solo because I'm just talking to the ether, but it's been so therapeutic for me to, to do this in a weird way. And what you don't realize, and this made me like feel so humble the other day, like, and just the gratitude was just like, I, I couldn't, I can't even explain it, but I got a message from a, from a really old friend in Louisiana and she's like, Hey, your episode with, with ketamine, like, I can't thank you enough for doing that and having that guest on there and talking about that. I was like, Oh, thank you. You listened. And she's like, we did more than listen. Like my husband has got back from like three tours and he's been struggling with PTSD. And after listening to your podcast and like being okay with like Jeremy being such a big dude and a, you know, tatted up and, yeah. and everything and just being honest about it. Like he's going to try this therapy to like, and it was like, and I, I'm not condoning ketamine therapy at all, but I'm just saying like people listen to it and you don't think it has any kind of an impact at all to people, but that's like one little person out of the, somebody picks up something and it like helps them in their day or it's just like, so it's, it's weird. It's like, even though it's like such a selfish, like personal thing to do this podcast for me, cause I know I'm gaining from it. Like, I also know that other people hear it and they're like, they're appreciative at times of it. And it's like, it makes you feel better about what you do. Yeah. yeah or it, feel, it makes you feel less guilty about like, I want to have a, I, I'm, I'm honestly interested in every guest that comes on the show. Cause I, I want to, even if I only know like a little sliver, I'm, I want to know more. I'm just such a geek when it comes to that. But like, I also know in the back of my head that it's, it helps me and that's selfish. But I know that because of that selfish act, there's a chance that somebody out there could hear something and it could be like literally 60 seconds out of an hour and a half and it can make their day. And I'm like, okay, it's all, it's all worth it. Yeah. I like, I had a similar feeling like when I was in rehab, I just, I was like, if I can positively impact like one person, one kid, that's enough. That's mm -hmm. enough to make everything that I've gone through worth it. And so like, I totally get it. Like one person is all it really takes. And like, sometimes you don't even know who you're talking to, like what person it is, but like, I get it. Cause like, I was like, well, if I can just motivate one person, if I can inspire one person, like the accident, everything is worth it, you know? And so I get it. What drove you to, to going back to coaching or going to coaching volleyball? Has that uh, always been like a passion for you? I started coaching when I was 19. Started coaching my freshman year of college. Um, I fell in love with it. Uh, my college coach, my freshman year, tore me to pieces um, and then ended up blacklisting me in the state of Wyoming when I decided to leave. And so I decided I never wanted a player to feel as low as I felt in that season. And I started coaching. Um, I was the JV coach for two, two or two years, maybe two or three years before my accident. Um, and then 
Tareen, um, she actually came up and sat with me in the ICU and even visited me a couple times. And then Todd McMinniman, who is also the wrestling mm-hmm. coach over in Bayfield, two of my biggest role models. Um, they both told me, they were like, you're going to get back to it, Susie. Like, you'll get back to coaching. And when I was in the ICU, I had cards and letters and like, I have a box of letters from players all over, um, all over the state of Colorado, from Wyoming that were just like, thank you, parents. Like, thank you so much for coaching my daughter. And I I just remember sitting in the ICU room room and being like, I just want to coach. Yeah. Like, and I don't coach for the praise. Like, you don't coach for the pay. You don't coach for the praise. Like, you coach because you want to make a difference in a kid's life. And that's all I wanted to do. And so I went back to coaching. And it, like I said, like, the 2022 season saved my life. Between the coaching staff and the players and the parents, like, they saved my life. And they don't even know it. Mm-hmm. And, um, but it is, it's like, it's my safe haven. Like when I go into the gym, I, I'm not in a wheelchair. I am not the girl from the red Jeep. I am, I'm just a coach. Yeah. And so that's just, that's where I'm happy. Like, I don't worry about school. I don't worry about my personal life. Like I just, that's your place. <laughs> that's my place. That's my happy place. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. Yeah. So are you, uh, so volleyball, what season is volleyball? Is that spring? Fall. Well, okay. eh, it's fall. Yeah. And then w- summer volleyball will start up pretty soon. Um, But yeah, it runs in the fall. Yeah. Hmm, that's awesome. I, I love hearing that. <laughs> <laughs> it, just, it makes me, you know, kind of almost tear up under under all this bravado. But uh, yeah, it's, you know, it is, coaching is awesome. I, I I can't do it, but I have such a huge respect for it. You know, I just, I'm, I, I'm the loudest dad on the sideline. Always. Like I will support and support and cheer on the team and do whatever. Um, but I just don't, I don't have that coaching element. Like it's, it's not even, I, I, I know that I, you would like, I don't know why I just can't do it. But like I've, the impact that I've personally felt from so many coaches is just, it's just outstanding, you know? And, um, so th- it's weird that you say that it's like they saved your life, but, and they don't know it. But at the same time, it's like, I don't think that most kids, especially at the high school, maybe even the collegiate level. I don't think understand they understand that, that, that level of impact that they're getting, you know, and sometimes it's cause they don't have it at the house or, you know, they'll get that from a parent. Um, but you know, it's just, it's, you, you realize it like when you're in your thirties and you're like, <laughs> fuck man, like they, they just, they, they're there for you in such a formative manner that it's like, it's just, you, you know, it's just constantly just putting stuff into your brain that you don't, you don't realize. And you just think that it's, you know, okay, how do I, how do I run this football or whatever? It's, you you don't even think about the times like, okay, after practice, I'm walking back with the one coach and we're just talking about math class or we're talking about, oh, I just broke up with this girl and I was a little distracted today. And they're kind of just having that one, you know, those things that like you don't think about in the moment as a player, but that coach, and maybe that coach doesn't even remember that moment, but it has such a huge and profound impact at that, you know, for that child, you know, for that athlete. Yeah. And so it's, it's amazing, you know? Well, I know all my coaches. So I got really lucky when I was playing. So I had Tareen Fouts, um, as a coach and then I had Kelly Rifolato, who's the Durango high school coach as a coach too. Um, and then Todd McMimming who coaches wrestling. He's just, he's like a second dad to me, but all three of those coaches are, you know, like they all texted me when I got hurt and they, they still like, ta- like I still talk to all of them. Mm-hmm. And so that kind of relationship has really evolved over the years, like from a player to now someone like that, I just have a conversation with, but those three coaches like impacted my life in such a positive way that I think that's why I knew my college coach. I didn't want to be like him. Mm-hmm. I wanted to be like these three coaches. 
I wanted to be there for the kids. Um, but yeah, coaches, coaches can make a big impact. And I don't know, I always hope that I'm, I'm a good coach, <laughs> right? Yeah. But the 2022 season was like a huge year just for me. And, um, and I, the girls were great, you know, like I couldn't have asked for a better year and I'm just grateful that I got that opportunity to do it again. Yeah. But so what's, what's on the horizon for you? Are you going to keep coaching? Are you gonna, is, yep. Can you tell us about any big <laughs> events? Are you going to go coach CU Boulder? Or <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Um, I will coach the 2023 season um, as the JV coach. I will say that we're pretty excited about the up and coming teams. Um, there's some great athletes in Bayfield right now, so it makes coaching that much more fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But um, we are excited about the upcoming seasons, and yeah, um, summer is always pretty busy with some camps and just some open gyms. Um, but it should be a good. It should be a good year, yeah. I think. <laughs> That'd be awesome. So, do you do yeah. that? Do you do that full time in the volleyball season? Is that pretty much a full time requirement? Because you guys practice daily. I'm. I'm yeah, we practice about every single day for two and a half hours okay. and then we have some games um so it's i don't know i don't think of coach as work it's like mm -hmm. more of my hobby um but yeah so you do that for about two and a half months you'll go from august until first week of november and then if you go to state it's the second weekend of november um, but so it's just a kind of short period of time and then you get that winter and spring off Yeah, and then summer volleyball kind of starts back up and you'll do a couple open gyms here and there and then some team camps, but pretty lightweight. Yeah. That's not bad. I mean, yeah. I, not bad. You, you enjoy it. So it's <laughs> all, none of it's bad, but you know, I just was, you know, you, you see some of these coaches, even Todd was a, my, the, one of the wide receiver coaches when, when I was in high school playing football and, um, and, uh, they're just, they're there all the time. And he, at that time he was an unpaid coach. He was like an assistant. Uh, he was the J one of the JV coaches, but he was an assistant for varsity. And it's like, I, he wasn't making a dime. Like he was there <laughs> because he cared and he just had a love for the game and knew that they needed assistance. And it was just like, man, this, yeah, you know, it's just like you, 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 but in the moment you don't think of it. He's just a guy. He's walking out here. He's carrying duffel bags. What are we doing? You know, it's like, I, I look at my, my son's coaches right now and, um, he pays, uh, uh, 11U comp soccer. And so we're on a travel team. So it's, uh, we lucked out this year and, and, uh, got on a team and hopefully we'll be with, with these two coaches, but their husband and wife team and, um, they have such a really good way of interacting with the kids, you know, and, and, um, you know, Amanda is, she's, she's rough around the edges. She knows the game so well and she's, she's real loud and, um, you know, very vocal about what, what you're doing and is not afraid to be like, you did that wrong. Like, you know what I mean? Like she's that kind of coach. She doesn't ever put anybody down, but she's very direct. And then she has, they have such a yin and yang because her husband, Danny, is so mellow and so, so it's like <laughs> it, it was just teasing the other night i was like you guys are like good cop bad cop you know so because you know it's like you'll get slammed over here and then all of a sudden it's danny's coming up but it's such a great way to work it because she'll she'll you know grill a kid for not doing something and then on the back end danny pulls the kid aside and they're working on that same thing so it's like we're we're gonna we're not gonna praise you if you do wrong like the job is to learn it and get it right yeah but then it's like we're taking you over here and we're gonna work on that problem or we're going to, you know, so it's the growth that they're, that they're seeing is kind of crazy. And I've, I've seen them coaching other, other, uh, age groups for throughout the years. And it's like, you watch them and the two or three years ago, I saw them working on like opening up a, a hip pass, like, like a through pass. And so, um, you start to see that. And so like now we're into the, the second half of the first season. And so they're starting to work those kind of drills. And so everything is layering and it's, it's so, it's really kind of awesome as a parent, as a, as somebody, I, like I didn't grow up playing soccer. I, I still know very little about it, but I enjoy it. And my son loves it and it's new to me. It's fresh. So it's like, I enjoy watching a game that I don't understand because I'm constantly learning. My brain's working. 
Um, but watching them really build and cultivate these kids to get better in a kind of a slow game process yeah. where it's not, we're taking the best six and we're just going to go try and score goals. Like, no, we're, we're building you guys so that way when you are 16 or 18, you know, and you're at, you know, junior or senior level, you have a full understanding of how this game is supposed to be played and you're playing it very well. It's just, it's really awesome to see that from a coaching level, you know, so hats off to coaches. I couldn't do it. <laughs> I could not do it. I could, there's no way I would, uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm not cut out for that. I'm not cut out for that life. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, the, I will say like, I think this was probably one of my best seasons. Um, I actually remember telling to you, I was like, I'm a better coach in a wheelchair than I was standing. I was gonna say you, you, you <laughs> better season for you coaching personally, or just yeah. kind of a multitude. Good, good, I mean, good athletes, good athletes, uh, my team actually won the IML, the JV IML. So nice. um, it was a great season, really. But um, yeah, personally, like I am a much better coach in a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's just, you know, everything that I've gone through, I have a little bit more patience. Um, I'm not so hot headed. When I first started coaching, I definitely uh, cussed at a couple of refs. <laughs> I'm not proud of. <laughs> but. Yeah. And I will still go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a ref if they make the wrong call, but sure. <laughs> not as often anymore. Um, and there's just a lot more maturity that I have, and it was really cool to like kind of see how I've evolved over the last few years coaching. Just, um, But it was cool. Yeah. So, And, I mean, we have a great coaching staff at Bayfield, so it just – that makes things even better. Sure. Um, yeah. But. Did you lose any girls off your JV team that are going to probably go to varsity this year? <laughs> oh, I can't talk about that. <laughs> Not yet. Oh, <laughs> uh, shoot. Yeah. I will say, like I said, I mean, um, we are excited about um, some classes. Yeah. You know, um, Jay, I mean, varsity's losing quite a few kids, so it'll be interesting to see kind of where everything falls. We had seven seniors, mm. which was a huge senior class. Sure. Um, so filling seven spots on varsity is going to be really big. But we have great athletes. So um, every year we, you kind of get a guess of kind of like what your prediction is and every year it's different. Yeah. You know, every year you can see a new kid, you can just see their like how they evolve over summer or sometimes you get just a random kid that you know they weren't there all summer but they come in and like they can play. Sure. And so when it comes down to like season starting and picking teams like you go into tryouts with a fresh set of eyes and you're like all right the best, the best, yeah. you know, like the best are going to play. Where do we want to seed everyone? Where, where do we think everyone's going to grow for the program? Yeah. I think is the biggest thing that we look at. Like, okay, are they going to grow here? Or are they going to grow here? Um, but yeah, I think we're excited about the future of Bayfield for sure. Um, and this, like this past season was just kind of like an eye opener in some ways, we're like, oh, man, these kids are really, really developed. They're competitive. They want to play. And so that's that also makes coaching pretty fun. Yeah. <laughs> when yeah. you have kids that hate to lose. <laughs> Adds a yeah. level to it. Yeah, for sure. It's always fun to watch that, man. Kids get, when they're inspired to to win as a team and to do their best, like, at all costs, is, I don't think there's. You can't put a price yeah, on it. I yeah. mean, like, and. Uh, all you can really ask from kids is like, come in, work hard. Yeah. Especially like towards the end of season, they just come in, work hard. I know you're tired. Okay, just push through a little bit harder, a little bit longer, and then you get a break. Um, and when you ask that of kids, like they want to do well. Yeah. And that was the biggest thing that I saw this year. Like we had kids who, like you could see, they were so tired. They were ready for season to be over. Um, and especially like on my team, like I saw it, we would go through practice and like, it wasn't always a great practice, but we got to that IML tournament and they just played out of their shoes. Like, I was like, I don't even know 
I didn't coach this team. I know that. <laughs> like, I don't know where they came yeah. from, but like. <laughs> that's awesome. Stepped um, it up. Last minute. That's good. Yeah. And I think that was just like the competitive drive. Like, they wanted to play well. And that's all you can do for as a coach. Like, you can ask kids to come in, work hard, come in, work hard. And when they do that every single day, win or lose, mm-hmm. like, you still got the best kids. Yeah. You know, like, that's the way I look at it. Sure. No, absolutely. They give it, you got to give it 100%. You yeah. know, when it matters, you better have 100% in the tank. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, well, Susie, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really, I really appreciate you coming in. It was a, it was the pleasure, I think, was, was on my side. So thank you so much. Um, thanks for being honest. And yeah, maybe we could do it again sometime. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It was, it was great. Absolutely. I had, I had fun. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. No worries. Have you ever felt? Are you listening? Damn. Uh. Yeah. Uh.